really great you've joined us today. I've been really enjoying the, the comments about the weather um, that you've been sending in from all around the world, from England, from Spain, from Melbourne, um, everywhere. Here in Berlin, it's freezing cold. And uh, in Norway, it's pretty cold too. And I'm so happy and honored to, to, to welcome. OK, here we go, Freudis. Freudis re Werke. Did I say that right? I look very close. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Horn Hangouts. Everybody's been waiting for you to come. You've been right on the top of the list of the guests we've wanted to, to invite. So thank you so much. How do we pronounce your name exactly? Well, in Norway it is pronounced Freudis Re Vekke. But you know, I'm used to the American version, Freudis. How are you, Freudis? So that's okay. <laughs> Freudis Re Vekre. Yeah, that's good. Everybody at home, all together? Freud, Re, Vekre. There you go. All these horn players practicing your name. And tell me the other thing. This has nothing to do with horn playing whatsoever. When I write your name, you have an O with a slash in it. How the heck do you find that on a computer? I couldn't find it. <laughs> no. Usually, uh, it's only in Scandinavia. It's, uh, it's, it's similar to the German O with the, with the two dots. Um, no. It's yeah. the same, same letter, it's just a Scandinavian way of writing it. So what happens if I don't use it, then your name sounds really different? Freud is? It's, it's yeah. not, it doesn't matter, it doesn't okay. matter. Well, it's this is all matter. totally, everyone's saying at home, talk about the horn. Okay, sorry, we're going to talk about the horn now. <laughs> um, this was just one of the things I noticed when I was writing your name a lot for all the publicity for this. But uh, anyway, we are thrilled you are here. You are at home. Yes, I'm at home. Um, which is? Uh, Stabæk is a little, little small place uh, right outside of Oslo. Right, and you have, you have a wonderful uh, helper today, Heidi, who's there with yeah. you. Thank yes. you, Heidi. I don't know if we can see you. You're probably filming. But you're yes, welcome to come and see you. Heidi Martinson yeah. is her name, yeah. Thanks, Heidi. It's great that you can help us out today. So she's filming on the other side so that when the interview's finished, then um, we can edit it all together and make it look nice. So, Freudis, um, officially you've retired, but you're actually busier than ever. That's uh, right. It's amazing to me as well. But uh, I got, in Norway, we have age limits, you know. And uh, like 70, that's the end of, end of it. So you're supposed to rest after that. Uh, so I got a new job in Sweden, in Ingesund, in Arvika, and I'm connected with Manchester, Royal Northern College of Music. I go there three times a year. And surprisingly, I got a lot of master classes to go to, <laughs> like in Bern, in Leipzig, etc., etc. Fantastic. We want to Paris. Come here. Paris. Yeah. You have to come to Berlin soon. It's about time you came back here because um, it was so nice to see you when we were on tour. We were we were on tour in Oslo and we came out of the out of the concert and there was Freudis and Dan. It was so happy. We were so happy to see you. It was a good concert. Likewise, we had fun. The concert was great. Yeah, it was it was yeah. fun. Um, so you haven't retired. You're very busy, which everyone will be very happy about. Um, can I ask you something about the master classes you do all over the world? Do you find that the, it's always in the end about the same questions. Do you find this, that it, the same topics come up wherever you are? Or do you find that it's sort of more specific to the, the, the type of horn school being studied in those places? Yeah, 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 that's a good question because I think the, there are differences. It depends on the local teacher mm -hmm. where, the, where the priorities in that particular class is uh, or the lack of priorities or whatever. Uh, mm. So I, I don't think it's always the same, but I mean, of course, the basic stuff, play in tune on time, <laughs> uh, play with a nice sound, you can discuss so if it's below the hell or the resonance, yeah. etc. Yeah. You know, clean articulations, interesting music. Those things are the same, but you know, the psychological parts are different, I think. Yeah. Girls yeah. and boys are somewhat different sometimes. We've had, yeah. actually, this is of course a huge topic for you and I, because uh, I just want to tell um, our friends that are watching, when I was growing up um, as a young horn player, there were actually no, no, well, no real girls you could go to to ask about how to do it. The only female teachers there were were Freudis, at least near Freudis, how's that better? And Marie-Louise Neunecker. 
Um, and then, of course, in America a lot. But but in Europe, that was actually all there were. So, I mean, I was very lucky that I could come and take a few lessons with you. Um, it's a lot easier for girls these days because there's, there's quite a few to, to ask. Um, but Colin from Spain has asked a question. Sarah and Freudis, you are both girl horn players. Do you find the horn is now considered equally a girl's instrument everywhere in the world? What do you think? I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's not considered equally everywhere in the world, absolutely not. But uh, there, there is enough um, smart and, and uh, good female horn players around that, uh, that one knows that it can be done. However, I do think still that uh, there is an issue of, of lung capacity. Uh, that, of course, some of the big guys have an advantage. But on the other hand, the small girls, <laughs> or the old girls like myself, uh, need to be smarter, smarter, smarter with what they have. So it, it all comes down to that, uh, for me anyway, that music and psychology are the two biggest issues, you know. And then your physical capacity comes in as number three. Don't you find often that if someone's really talented and just playing, they end up doing it right anyway, whether they're a small girl or a huge guy. For some reason, the musicality in them um, makes them able to make long phrases and play loud and soft, and they don't actually think that much maybe about what they're doing. Um, those, are, those are the real true talents out there. Yeah, but you know, not... Yes, I agree completely, but the true talents aren't all that many, you know, and most people need to work, you know, and yeah. fix their fix their things, their stuff. Yeah. So when you give master classes everywhere, um, do people come to you especially as a, as a woman and, and, and want to know about lung capacity and, and how you do it? And, you know, you played an orchestra job as well. I mean, the soloists can, can um, practice in their own time, you know, at home. They haven't got the daily uh, uh, grudge of, of playing all the orchestral repertoire. Um, I find that quite, for me, as not, I'm not a soloist, just an orchestra player, sometimes for the body, quite a hard, a hard slog, as wonderful as it is. Oh, I already forgot the, the beginning of your question here. Oh, sorry. Let's I've, got so much I want, I've got so much I want to ask you. <laughs> um, I did play in orchestra, yes, and the question was? The question was, um, do people, uh, do you still find in your master classes today that people come to you, especially Ooh, okay. the girls, and want to know about lung capacity be my age <clears throat> try again um, no i would say no i think uh, people come to me i mean i have equally uh, male and female students uh, people come to me to get help and sometimes it maybe it's easier to ask a woman for help than a man i don't know i don't know it's very individual mm. uh, and they to get help with physical stuff or psychological stuff or musical stuff i mean there's really those three three issues and the psychological in the end is the biggest can you, more, can you be more specific about that i mean when somebody comes to get help is it because they need a, their chops aren't working or um yeah also, they they need they want help to play better not mm -hmm. necessarily because they have problems but i mean every young people almost every young student that i meet think themselves that they have problems but you know looking at it from outside there's problems are universal and they are not so so um, they are not so uncommon and they can be fixed but sometimes the problems are in their head more than anything else you know um, so it's it's a combination of, of things i mean it's really fascinating i must say and everybody's different yeah and that's hard to fix in a master class, isn't it? It is, but you can. I mean, my experience, you can get some results. I mean, I'm not saying I'm fixing up people in 30 minutes, absolutely not. But you can, you can give one or two ideas for them to think about for future. And if they're smart enough to record their lesson, they can go back and, and pick up a couple of more things maybe. Uh, I studied myself with uh, like not so many like two lessons with Mr. Jacobs you know was very important three or four lessons with Mr. Stamp and, and uh, I got a lot out of it because I was ready for it was it I mean that's totally do Jacobs is more the, the the physical blowing out and the James Stamp was very much the technical side wasn't he the, so you, the, you the amateur side yeah you could say or mm -hmm. he was also into the psychology of playing uh, but I mean, for the for the music, I had other teachers, of course. 
Yes. I took more than two lessons. <laughs> <laughs> and I got good help and I had good teachers. Uh, and therefore, I, I feel that I need to pay back. Yeah, it's yeah. I, I I know what you mean. I, I feel the same. And this is this, these horn hangouts are, are my my way of trying to 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 share what the the great people that I know and and the, the wonderful help that there is out there. And we've just had a message from Lisa Nelson, who's um, Jeff's sister. Hi, I know. Um, Hi. You know Jeff. And she just wrote, Freudus's book from the 90s was revolutionary for introducing these mental choices and performance technique, even for us flute players, because Lisa's a flute player. Thank, great for all performances, and your talks in BAMP were wonderful. So um, she must have been there. This is the book, ladies and gentlemen. Thoughts on playing the horn well, and if you haven't got it, you have to get it. Freudus, I wanted to ask you, is there a digital download of this you can get online? Not yet, no. Uh, Would but be there great. is a French version. There's a French version and a, coming up a German version. Oh, very good, very and good. And of course, there's <laughs> Hungarian and Czech and whatever yeah. Japanese. Yeah. What you want? Japanese version. Okay, okay. My actually, my favorite, very, my very favorite part is this one. Anyway, yes. <laughs> anyway. This, anyway, it's a fun. If you the, for you for the, those of you that don't know it, it's a whole section on what you have to do. If your mouth is dry, you have to play anyway. It, it, there's hundreds of things actually that you have to do anyway. Um, so uh, oh, let's see, we've got Stefan getting this in the camera here for later on. Good boy, <laughs> our cameraman. Um, there's a lot of fantastic stuff in your book, and it really is timeless. Um, so you you base your master classes on I've never actually been uh, had the privilege of doing a master class with you sadly yeah. we have to change that yeah <laughs> yeah I try to get some results and be efficient but also to make it humorous because it's so boring you know often and so so that also the audience can have a good time yeah uh, that's very important, it's important um, it's so. Balance. <laughs> So is there, I asked you at the beginning, I'm still, we're still trying to sort of get in there, the, the, the standard problems that people come to you with are the mental problems um, of maybe being too scared or feeling not good enough? Yeah, that's one of them. That's a big one. And um, also not being too harsh on themselves, too yeah. self-critical to a point that if I don't sound like uh, Radovan, or Stefan Dor or you know whoever your hero is I'm not good which is not true you know you can be good in your own in your own way so that's the mental side so and but with the um, what do you do in your master classes for the people that haven't had you know had the uh, possibility to take one do you do a, do you start with a warm up do you always do the same warm up do you change your warm up every day um, this is also a big question that people people always want to know about how do you warm up well, you know, first of all, I don't perform in public anymore. I this that was a decision I made a couple of years ago, uh, because it sounded pretty good, and I thought better stop when it's okay, you know. <laughs> and it's uh, so that's. But I do practice because of the teaching, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for me, I'm a little bit. I eat the same breakfast every day. I'm a little boring that way, and uh, <laughs> so the warm up is kind of. Tell us your secret of youth. What do you eat every day for breakfast? Well, Norwegian cheese, of course. <laughs> yeah, go to the like like fish. But, but, I mean, there are people who like to have habits like that, and there are people who like variation, and I think both is good. And I think variation is actually probably the best. Uh, yeah. To have a system so you know what you're doing and what you have been doing and what you should be doing. And mm -hmm. Don't forget to play stop torn and don't forget to keep your tongue in shape. That's uh, easy to lose the rapidity. Very easy. Uh, so, uh, but in the master class, I I only do warm up maybe once uh, for everybody if 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 they want it, mm. but not for every lesson. I mean, they come in, they play something, and uh, I feel like a, a second doctor or third doctor. You know, like you go when you're not happy with the diagnosis from your um, your normal doctor. You know, you go to another one or a specialist, yeah. and, and so it's like you know second opinion. Okay, I want a third opinion. You know, <laughs> and then you can get the you can get some. Uh, you can uh, give that. You can choose, of course, to give them the full list. Say, okay, I'll let me give you eleven things that you need to fix. Otherwise, you're a lousy player. Or I can choose, which I do. Okay, I'll focus on one or two issues here. 
Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I ask them also, what do you think yourself, you know? And sometimes, amazingly, they say, oh, yeah, I, I don't feel so good. You know, I said, well, we don't know that. We, we listen to your playing. Uh, how was your intonation, for example? Oh, my intonation? Well, it was, uh, I don't know. Well, so then my opinion is, yeah, your intonation could be better. You know, it could be better. <laughs> oh, it's better to say that than to say your intonation stinks, you know. Because <laughs> that will kind of drag the whole atmosphere down, you know. But if it can be better, it's like, oh, it's good, but it can be better. Okay. That's their so hope. So it's be positive in these master classes. Yeah, yeah environment. it's really important. important for yeah. the building of confidence. Right. I think to inspire is also the biggest thing, and everyone I've spoken yeah. to about you, who, who you've taught, have said you were their greatest inspiration. Denise Tryon said to me yesterday, she said she says you are totally responsible for her career and for her success as a low horn player, and she sends you lots and lots of love um, from yeah. Philadelphia. She's a fantastic player, so you've got a good one there. Lisa yeah. Ford, I spoke to yesterday. Um, just because I that's that's a great way to do research is not to not to look up on Google but to to ask friends you know for for special stories and 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 Lisa 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 was actually told me about your whistling which we're going to get to in a moment. <laughs> Keep tuning. We've got we've got some whistling coming up. But Freud, there's some more. Yeah, you better have some water. Um, a couple more questions, if I can. Um, uh, Ian uh, Ian from New York has. Asked, have you started the horn at a later age than most? You started age 17, I believe. That's right. Did you feel a lot of pressure to catch up on your peers? And how did you streamline your practicing to join the professional world just after two years of playing? That's a great question, actually. Because um, you did, yeah. you turned professional very quickly. I had never, I, I, I didn't have any thoughts of joining a professional world. I just picked up the horn because I thought it was uh, so fascinating. And we had some uh, some horn players in the youth orchestra where I played violin. I played violin since I was six, uh, and they were talking about you know the sound from eternity and how this horn was so wonderful, and and also they missed a lot of notes and um, made a lot of you know like wa waves about that. Anyway, so having the so-called uh, absolute pitch, perfect pitch, once I started to to fool around with it. To play, I realized that I had a big advantage because if I miss a note, I know I, I know if I miss it because I know which one I was supposed to get, and so the progress went really fast. And of course, I had a lot of chamber music and orchestra experience from from the violin, youth orchestras, uh, etc. So, so uh, I, but I didn't have any stamina or endurance or those things. But I could pretty much get around the horn. The biggest problem in the beginning was to read parts that were not in C. I was just going to say, with, with perfect pitch, it's actually really... So-called perfect pitch, yeah. Isn't it a little bit confusing, then, if, you, uh, if you're playing horn in D, horn in C, horn yeah. in F? In the confusing. beginning, yeah, in the beginning, it was confusing, because you, yeah, I, I grew up uh, thinking that the C is a C is a C is a C from the piano. But, you know, it just takes you a, a couple of weeks to realize that the C is just a symbol. It's the grundton, that's a kind of English grundton, uh, tonica. Yeah, the tonic. The, yeah. The A is the key in uh, whatever key. Uh, okay. So it, it's not so hard, you just have to learn it. Denise is watching, by the way. I just got a oh, message Denise. from Denise. Hello, ah. Denise. Hello. <laughs> watching from Philadelphia. Yeah. Isn't that great? I just, yes, I just love it. Yes, it's just been right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, Austin from Illinois um, said, speaking of intonation, Freud is, how did you develop your incredible sense of information? And how would you advise that teachers approach, how do you advise how teachers should approach teaching intonation to horn students who struggle? I mean, is there anything yes. particular that you would, that's a good yeah. question. Yes, yes, yes. I would like to speak about that. Um, good. Yes, because when I was a young teacher, like around 30 or so, um, I had the tendency, like many teachers, to think that if the students played out of tune, I was like, you know, wow, don't they hear it? 
are they stupid or what, you know? But then I took some violin lessons again with another teacher as a hobby, and he started to pick on my intonation. And I mean, my God, I have the so-called perfect pitch, you know? How can anybody criticize me? And this particular teacher was uh, had very good results, and his students all played really fantastic intonation. So I, I, that was a wake-up call. Wake up, wake up. You know, even my intonation can be better. Wow. So then I realized if he picks on me, I should pick on my students, of course, and not give up. Because that's what the problem is, I think. Many of the teachers who teach already have good ears from nature. And that's why they get good class. And then people say, oh, we want to take lessons with you because you're a good player and seem like a decent person, okay? So, and then it's so easy to, to get into that mode of, don't they hear it? Don't they hear? No, they need help. And they need more help than I needed at the time uh, to realize the, the goal, to, to make uh, strong definitions of like tempered intonation, uh, melodic intonation, big for the strings, and harmonic intonation in the chords. Uh, and they need help to, to find out so, you know, how can you learn to bend, how can you learn to use alternative fingerings if you, if you need it. You know, just and, and they need this every week or every day, little reminder or watch that note, you know, you know like, is that really what you wanted? Do you think that's what I would like to hear? They're just friendly um, reminders. And the kids who play string instruments, they get that all the time. They get that yeah, all the time. I find that string teachers are much stricter with intonation than we are. Much stricter. Yeah. Yeah, and it's very possible to get to, to say that. Uh, yeah, in my class they basically played in tune, but it was because I didn't give up. Yeah, yeah. Even if the ears were not always so strong. Also, recording because I find if I'm playing, practicing a piece, and I record, I think, oh, that wasn't maybe so bad. And then I listen to a recording I made of it, and you hear so much more when you listen to it again than when than while you're playing it. And it's really good to know that okay, I land on this note a little bit too high. So recording yourself is also great, isn't it? It's a great, it's like looking in the mirror and say, so So, how does the world see me today? <laughs> like now yeah. I'm looking at me and hello for this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and then when you listen to a recording, it's the same. It's like a mirror. Oh, is that what they hear? Oh my God. I thought, I thought, you know, myself yeah. Yeah. was different. Um, what, about, what about the machine? So many teachers put a machine in front of you, a tuning machine. Oh, I, uh, oh, oh, the tuning machine. The tuning yeah. machine is a crutch. I mean, it's, it's of course, it can, it can be helpful. But first of all, I, I go further than the tempered intonation. I think tempered is just the beginning. It's yeah. uh, okay for modern music, and, uh, but it's not for, it's the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, then you learn to play in tune by visual. Mm -hmm. Rather than, oh, I'm sharp, so I must go down instead of hearing it. Or instead of uh, even better planning it before you even play, mm, just really yeah. get, get organized a plan in your head for what you really want of the from in the intervals. Oh, uh, very but, important yeah. point. I really hope that answered the question. Um, that if there are any more, I'm sure they'll be coming. The questions are pouring in here, so I'm, oh, I'm, I, don't, I don't know quite how to how to um, to organize them all. We're going to go back to the history now a little bit. Your history, John in Ohio said in your book you spent lots of time working with James Stamps methods. Did you studied with him while you were in California? And were you influenced by the Los Angeles horn uh, brass at all while you were there? Um. I wouldn't call it that I studied with James Stamp. I, I attended one a week in Switzerland, a, a class he had, and I took uh, maybe one or two at the most lessons uh, in California, but after I actually had left there. But anyway, he was, uh, those, they were just precious moments. Uh, I mean, in, in one of the lessons, or the one lesson, I played, uh, I was going to be a soloist in Haydn second with the string orchestra. And he wanted me to play like, you know, okay, the second movement, you know. And I, at that time I had the problem, I don't know what you call it, but I call it the hesitation syndrome. You know, the one where you want to start and then you start. Stutter, yeah. Stutter. yeah. Uh, and uh, so I've had that. <laughs> uh, and, then he, of, and so I took a breath and I played. Ah! And then, of course, he picked up on that and said, oh, oh. Oh, oh, we can't have that, you know. So he fixed it. Oh my God, it's how? fantastic. How? I'll tell you how. Okay, he said, play, play an octave under, below, oh, the, the C sharp. 
written C sharp for us in F. So I did okay, bah, because that's not a difficult tone for me anymore. Oh, again, take again. Uh, okay, bah, and then it's like okay, plan prepare the same way, but play the next octave. So it was like playing dotty. It works fantastic for Bruckner four. You think this F, and then you play this F. Uh, uh -huh. It's like like a little grace note, but you just don't play it, but you think you play it. Okay. It means that you don't over prepare. You are relaxed until the moment that you need to grab the notes. And uh, if you have, it's like courage, you know, courage to trust. Like if I just do the right things, it'll pop out. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, it was fantastic. Yeah, and so I would say that I use his stuff is is more that uh, you know he was important on yeah. certain things, yeah. and I liked the, the idea of playing on the mouthpiece because that was ne never um, mentioned in my in Norway. You know, nobody did that in when I grew up. Like in the when when did I grow up in the fifties, oh, sixties, <laughs> <laughs> whenever it was. It doesn't matter. But you know, then this. This playing came around in the like eighties, and they say, "Why, why do we have to do that?" I'm a good player; I never did it, but you know, it helped me so much to get my lips ready. Yeah. Buzzing, also buzzing, and mouthpiece playing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, got me in the eye there, <laughs> <I did. laughs> So uh, anyway, going from Norway to Berlin. Is, <laughs> so, and then second half of the question: uh, What uh, Los Angeles? Um, yeah. Uh, Yes, I was there for two years, and uh, I hang out, was uh, hang out with some other brass players, and I was very inspired by the creativity uh, that the, the American or say West Coast musicians showed in their approach. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're, they're fantastic players, and they had good ideas. In Europe, uh, things tend to be more stuck in tradition. I know. <laughs> I still think it's great to go, if you're a horn student, to go uh, to as many places and hear as many horn schools as you can. The best thing about the internet and everything is you've, you've got it, you know, got it all online, but nothing beats a live, a live lesson and a live concert. That's, that's really just the best. Um, just something, someone's just written, uh, Natalie in Kentucky, they're really, uh, the America's really up early today. Hey, you guys, I'm impressed. Um, Tim in Melbourne is uh, up in the middle of the night and you guys are up really early in the morning, so thanks for that. Um, Freud is, uh, tell, Natalie says, my university students are often hesitant to play or practice outside of the school. I tell them the Freud is story about buzzing at the bus stop. Buzzing at the bus stop? What story is that? You used to buzz at the bus stop? That's, yes, absolutely. I go, took the bus to work and uh, I stood at the bus stop and waited and um, did my, my tuba buzzing warm up, which is like, you know. <laughs> And you know, and then the point being that uh, you can, you can, you have time during the day where you can do stuff like that. So if other, are your screen. If, other, <laughs> if other people don't like it, I turn around and go into the other direction. Or yeah. you know, as my first horn teacher said, if you meet somebody you know and you go, you are buzzing, it doesn't matter because you know them. Mm -hmm. If you meet somebody you don't know, it doesn't matter because you don't know them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Buzzing at the bus stop. Speaking of tuba buzzing, Roger Bobo is watching. Oh, um, wow. He's in Tokyo. Honor, thank you for joining us. He says, greetings from Tokyo. We are going to walk in Weimar together. I see you are an incredible teacher. So you two are going to do some master class in Weimar. Maybe I'll come. That's not so far away. Well, he's going to do his master classes and I'm going to do my master classes. But I think there will be a concert at the same time, yeah, <laughs> with our classes. I, I, I'm going to be a tuba player in my next life. I prefer playing down there. It's much more fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, Francia um, asks, what is the best way to get back into playing the French horn after two months without practicing? Well, I'd start and say two months without practicing is a very long holiday. Um, what are your tips of getting back into shape? I think two months is, for me would be way too long for stopping, but maybe someone's ill or maybe someone doesn't, yeah. doesn't have a chance to practice yeah. so much. Um, uh, so, uh, what, what are you, how would you start playing after a little holiday? Uh, or did you ever take holidays? Oh, she's from Honduras. Francia is from Honduras. Honduras, yeah. 
Ja, it could, it could be uh, in uh, circumstances that uh, make. But I would recommend buzzing, mouthpiece playing, and uh, playing five minutes and taking breaks all day long. Taking yeah. breaks, many yeah. breaks. Yeah. Breaks are almost more important than the playing. <laughs> you know uh, what? Lovely. We're going to have a little break from all the technical question now, and now it's time for you to perform. Oh my god! So, no. hoo -hoo. And when yeah. I say perform, guys, I've heard. I talked to uh, Lisa Ford yesterday, also a student and a great horn player uh, from Freudis, and she said, "Don't forget to ask Freudis about her whistling." And I remember. I've never heard it live. I remember people tell me about it. I've never heard it live. So I would be terribly honoured, as would the rest of us, if you would mind just showing us what this Freudis whistling is all about. Okay, but I could actually then just. Tell you how I, I came around it, how I okay. found out. Okay, yeah. I was whistling as a kid a lot, and I had a, I, yeah, I had lots of tunes in my head, and uh, I found out how you can uh, with the tongue you can um, instead of so like you have two strings on the violin, you play from one string to the other. So I kind of found two panels. Yeah. A lot of people can do that. They can imitate birds, etc. You know, <whistles> things like that. But anyway, so then I like did a melody and I added the second voice uh, as grace note. Also, for example. That's not two voices, but it's the idea, you know. It's like that. I was, I was wondering whether so was that my... at some point, can you hear me? Do yeah, I need I more? No, 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 mm -hmm. that's fine. I was just, I was trying to hear the the, the second voice in there. I thought maybe my good yeah, voice. no, but this was there was no second voice. There was just grace notes. Um, okay. But then at some point, I did find that if I w took one note in an easy range, and then another one, like a small third, is easy interval. And suddenly, I could find a place in the middle where I got kept the one when I went to the other. Okay. Uh, and so that's the basic principle, you know. And then, of course, I was thrilled and thought, "Wow, this is fun! I never heard this before." So I practiced, you know. And then, um, for example, um, Hear how lonely the last voice is alone. <laughs> so that was to, uh, yeah. This doesn't it doesn't it doesn't do the, do you justice this 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 webcam. Unfortunately, we're going to have to get you here and record that live and put it on YouTube. But that is so <laughs> impressive. I, uh, I I could never. I can't. I can only whistle when I breathe in. Like oh. the breathing out didn't work. So I am I am amazingly impressed. And so you buzz and you whistle at the bus stop. Yeah, yeah. And when I was younger, I whistled a lot, but uh, that's kind of I'm out of practice now. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean, yes. Mm. Well, Lisa and Martin in Gothenburg are watching, and they I think they're very impressed with that. Now, not only do we have a break from the technical stuff with your whistling, we have a visitor for you. We have a visitor for you. Someone that wanted to come and say hello. I wonder if she remembers me. Hello, hello. Fergus! Oh, hello, Fergus. Hi. Long time, hello. <laughs> Do you remember when we last uh, played together? When was that? Oh, this is a great, this is a great story. Do you Tell me. The, the horn party at Johannes Wyskowski's house in Tutsi, yes. 1983. <laughs> it was the ARD horn competition. And you were on the jury, I think. Yes, uh, I was. We caught the last train back into Munich. And we played yes. horn quartets in the, train. the train. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, boy. I scared off all the people who were trying to get on at various stations and all ran the other way, ran to other cars. They didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> you, you hadn't had a beer, you hadn't had a few too many oh, beers to drink. I didn't touch you? a drop that night. Not no, a drop. T total she was. <laughs> it was all her idea. Who well, else was playing with you? Bruno Schneider perhaps have played with it, I think. 
maybe. Bruno, Sarah, and yourself, and me, and I can't remember who else. It was 1983, so I, you're forgiven for not remembering. Most anyway. of the audience wasn't born then. <laughs> it certainly beats buzzing at the bus stop. I mean, it's much better than playing around the time. Playing quartet. You've had quite a career, Freudis, really. I'm impressed. Yeah, I'm <laughs> about this train playing. <laughs> So we are. Um, we've been. This book actually belongs to Fergus. I couldn't find mine today in a hurry. So Fergus, I, I cherish this. He, he absolutely. You oh. actually. What was this? <laughs> you see, thoughts on playing the horn well, and written on it is oh well, never mind. Oh well, That's never mind. Right. <laughs> That's good. You do not. <laughs> there was some. There was some jokes about. Oh, you, you wrote that. Uh, <laughs> about citing it to Japanese, you know. The thoughts while playing the horn on my well. <laughs> but uh, I think I got it. Thoughts at all about playing the horn. Another great thing that you've written, Troy, this that's online that people can find is a is is a, is a group of, of of nevers. You wrote a paper oh, yeah. about that. never mm -hmm. say never, and you can find it online. I think it's on on the mouthpiece site. Yeah. On your mouth, right? I think, yeah. and um, and it's like never. It's all the things that you're told never to do. Never raise your shoulders while breathing. Never all this. And but the very last one is my favorite. Freud says, "Never leave before you get paid." And you, <laughs> and you said, you said you wished you could live by that one, but you know, real life is sometimes different. <laughs> real life. Real life. What is, what is yeah, that was something I wanted to say about the. Um, Studying in Russia, but now I forgot really the angle. But uh, we'll get back to that. Okay. Because I, I didn't only study in America. I mean, I this, did we, study. We, I would like to get very much onto the Russian study. So actually, this would be mm. a wonderful. So thank a you, wonderful. Fergus. Thank you so much for uh, reminding me. And uh, also, I. Yeah, that was great seeing you again. I have to run away now. There's a young man standing behind me somewhere. Where is he? Nice. Yeah. I've got his yeah. phone. Duty is calling. Back to work, yes. Yeah. See if I don't try not to ruin him. Um, just a quick word to the viewers: Fergus is going to be on at the end of February talking about his book as well. Um, yes, so, yeah, about that. yes. Mm. So yes. you're all doing this for that. You don't have a copy yet. I must send it to you. Okay. Good. Okay. Enough. From, enough. <laughs> Thank you for stopping by. Okay. Lovely to see bye. you. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> right. Isn't that nice? The Philharmonie is yes, full of your fans. <laughs> Full of your time. That, you know that train playing. I've really gotten far back in my memory, but it came out now. Came back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone's just written in with a whistle. Take the last train to Munich. So thank you, Aaron, for that. Take the last train to Munich. <laughs> um, tell us about your your Russian studies, because that was a very important part of your your training, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I, I got the job very early. I was like 19, and I got a job in the opera, and then I was 20, I got a job in the Oslo Philharmonic. And by, you know, 25 or so, I felt, you know, I really should study somewhere. I should find out more about what I'm supposed to know. Uh, so I decided to go to Russia, and I got a so-called Staatsstipendium. At that time, it was Soviet Union, you know. And uh, I had met Leonovsky, and I heard him play, and I thought he was a fantastic musician. Of course, it was a different style, but I didn't think so much about that. I wasn't going there to copy him. I was just going there to, to become a better musician mm -hmm. uh, and, and why, hopefully a new why player. Choose Russia? Why choose Russia? Why not go to... Well, you went to the States as well. but uh... Yeah, that's a good question. I got intrigued by his playing and, uh, I, well, I just went there. Yeah, actually, there was a Danish... And Norwegian, another Norwegian who went there first, Bjorn Fustal, principal in Denmark's radio. And he had heard the recording. He went to Eiffel James in England. And Eiffel put on a LP, or little LP, with the Schumann Adagio Legger or Buenowski's recording. And he said, you know, listen to this. I could never do anything like this. It's completely... Uh, Super slow and it's super. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic recording. You could call it exotic if you like. But anyway, so Bjorn Fostol went there because he liked that recording, and then I thought, well, if he goes there, I should go there too. So it was just a lot of coincidence, coincidental things that yeah. made me do that, take that decision. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic player, amazing player, really, also very inspirational. Um, mm. 
uh, I'm, I'm jumping around a bit here because there's, I, I usually like to have a plan of how the interviews go, but there's just so many questions coming in for you and Fergus coming in and you whistling and it's, it's, it feels like it's just a big chaotic thing today for me, but um, I'm just so happy that everyone's joining in. Um, I, Travis has put up a link to the, uh, this is the great thing when we talk about something, it's on the internet, um, the, the viewers put up links on it, so the, the link to your Never page is... Oh. Um, is up already, thanks Travis for that. Um, Wendell Ryder, hi Wendell, he said you are such an expressive player, how do you work with students in terms of musicality? I like that question. That's a big question. Yeah, it's huge, we need about three hours for that. <laughs> yeah, all right, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I try to write things down and I have a, like a map, a map of everything that, uh, you know, checklist, you know, sound, articulations, and I just try to to influence by by showing or by suggesting or by encouraging the the good stuff. And I mean, um, asking questions. You know, like we have we have two performances, for example, of the same piece, and uh, I would say, okay, this one was more charming. Mm. So what exactly is charm? Is it like more dots here, more lines there, or where does you know? But in the end, you can encourage people to to try things and and come out and and play. More interesting, which is really the, the, in the end the, the most important thing. This is a question for me. When you get someone in a master class in front of you who's just so terrified that mm -hmm. they can't bring their musicality out, um, mm -hmm. I always I always die for these people who are playing for me because I think it's only me. I'm not a you know yeah. I, I I die just as much as they do. But what is the best way for you to bring someone out of their shell and calm them down in a master class situation? Or something they can use for later when they do get nervous. A couple of good jokes always helps. You know, <laughs> I got my little toy tools, a little shark that helps them with yes. their breathing. This was something, this was something the same time. Yes, Lisa told me about this yesterday. She said, Ask Freud is about her tools. And I was like, Her tools? And she said, Yes, her yeah. wind up toys and her jokes. Yeah. So yeah. I think jokes are a fantastic way of breaking the ice, but you bring actually little little things with you. Tell us. I usually do, yeah. And uh, if if there is a pr problem like that, people are terrified, like you said. You know, if I pull out a little take wind up thing and make them play with it, you know, they they usually the eyes uh, breaks so, and they get more relaxed and get a few laughs and they can play better. Yeah. It's all in the in here. You know. What are your What are your best jokes for such um for such uh, situations? <laughs> no, not not jokes, jokes, but uh, funny things. Uh, I mean, for example, I have a a pencil which looks like a pencil. Okay, it looks it's perfect. You, you buy it in uh, those stores, you know? and so I put it on the music stand, and then the, then they, I say, you know, you should you should really take a breath right there. You know, write it in. So they grab this pencil because it's there, and then it turns out to be rubber, rubber pencil. I know you got a good laugh. So they get a good laugh because I lured them, right? Yeah. I used to do that to the bass clarinet player who was sitting next to me in the orchestra. You know, yeah. built up some trust. He borrowed the pencil many times, and then one time I put that one there. You know, good joke. That's a good joke. Uh, so you know, <laughs> it, it cracked. You should try that. You know, I should. I should. That's a the great orchestra, one. I'm just... The orchestra players always borrow your pencil, right? This is the thing. Why do no solo horn players have pencils? We always have to have pencils. They never have a pencil. Why is that? What can you tell me? You are a principal horn. Why do the principal horns part of never the ego is part of the ego? You know, somebody else must supply me with the the necessary ego. <laughs> yeah, I count, and I and well, I I try to count and provide the That's pencil. Not, yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a second horn player in Bergen who was there for, I don't know, 30 years or 40 years, and he said he'd been through 17 first horn players, and they all did not have a pencil, and they all smelled of old booze. <laughs> well, I, I certainly have been very lucky not to, but mine don't smell of old booze, <laughs> oh, but they was... do run off with my pencils, so shame on them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so now the chat is now people are starting to write in on the chat about I always have a pencil clip but seldom there is a pencil attached to it yes. well Marcus you're a second horn player they usually do have a pencil clip a yes. pencil clip onto it um, quick question from um, Carolis oh gosh Kola Kaukskus von Vilnius Carolis sorry if I said your name wrong big fan of yours Freudis what are your top breathing exercises now we don't have too much more time and me as a girl would also love to hear your top 
top breathing exercises. I think you you figured out all of that out. You spent what six weeks in Chicago yourself, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. So, no, my top breathing exercises is oh oh, it's uh, just breathe a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's one that goes like this, you know, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, okay. sometimes fast and sometimes slow. And um, there is this with the hand, of course, it's a Jacobs thing, you know. I, I don't have any special breathing exercises that I don't think people know, but the, my, my biggest thing is to allow your upper body to expand. Like the tuba players, yeah. The tuba players have figured this out, and the flute players, the best flute players. Yeah. Look at flute players, really, flute players. I never realized how much air flute players need because most of it disappears anyway. Yeah, so they, they need a lot. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I think it's it's this um, more this um, openness to <laughs> to really finding your maximum when you need it, and you need it more often than you think for quality. Yeah. Not just for long phrases, but for quality slurs, quality sound, quality yeah. phrasing. So there are so many more questions. I think we're just going to have to get you back on, um, if you wouldn't mind, um, <laughs> right. because, because this is just so amazing for us to be able to, and for people that live, you know, we've got some Francian Honduras and people that do not have the access to be able to come to master classes of yours. Um, it's such a treat to have you here in front of us. Um, what do you think of all this digital era? Well, I'm, I'm of course, in the back front there, but uh, I think it's fantastic and it's fascinating that this is possible. This is what we're doing now. Yeah. And uh, it's, it just opens up so many possibilities. I have done a masterclass online a couple of times mm -hmm. with, you know, me being in Oslo and somebody being in Rochester, New York, playing yeah. for me and vice versa. Uh, but still, it's a little, this is completely uh, like open, like a chat. Yeah, it's, it is. So, okay. and I think it's fantastic that you're really doing it because it's a lot of work after all. That's a lot but of work. It, it's turning yeah, into yeah. more than a hobby for me. It was just a hobby at the beginning and now I've got two wonderful cameramen here. I've got Tim in Melbourne. Um, it's turning into quite quite a big thing and it takes up a lot of time, but these are the most imp most wonderful hours spent for me with, with friends and, and colleagues online. And, and the great thing is that we've got all our horn audience out there. There are so many names I recognize on the chat and they're all recognizing each other as well on the chat. It's a whole little community, a horn hangout community that's being built. So. Um, I was going to say one thing about the article. Uh, I have over the years written uh, quite a few little articles about this and that. Uh, and my plan is to put them together in like a similar book, like, you know, collected articles in the Wonderful. future. In the Wonderful. But we need um, a digital version as well. I mean, you can you can put it mm -hmm. online and, and have people buy it online. But um, when yeah. we go off air, Tim is going to have a talk to you about that anyway, because okay. we, we, we have some ideas. So. Oh. Um, so, because I think all these articles you've written should be should be available. When I was researching you, I couldn't find that many of them online. Yeah. Um, so we'll have to. I promise we'll get Freudis organized and okay, get good. a printed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I need somebody to manage the rest of my life. Good. Right. We're on. We're on it. We're on it. Tim and I are on it. Freudis, thank you so much. We have to unfortunately leave you now, but promise us you'll come back. Promise. Sure. Sure. Promise. All the best for you and um, keep warm up there. It's freezing up in Norway, yeah. I hear. <laughs> and we'll see you back here very soon on the Horn Hangout. Mm -hmm.